Welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Richard LaRiviere, president of the University of Oregon. Richard LaRiviere became president of the UO on July 1, 2009, after serving as executive vice chancellor and provost at the University of Kansas from 2006 to 2009. Before his move to Kansas, he worked as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Texas at Austin from 1999 to 2006. La Riviere's scholarly roots extend around the world. After earning his bachelor's degree in the history of religions from the University of Iowa, La Riviere and his wife Janice traveled to India for the first time. La Riviere eventually built an impressive academic career around the country's languages, histories, religions, and culture. He earned his doctorate in Sanskrit from the University of Pennsylvania. He reads eight languages and speaks French and Hindi as well as English. He has conducted research in London, Oxford, Calcutta, Pune, Kathmandu, Tokyo, Beijing, Lahore, Munich, Colombo, and Madras, as well as a host of smaller cities in India. Richard, welcome to U of O. Thank you. And welcome to U of O today. We're really pleased to have you on the show. My pleasure. You've been on the job for about three months now, and you came from Kansas most immediately and Texas before that. What do you perceive as some of the cultural differences between Oregon and the other places you've worked? That's a great question. Um, well, we sort of grew up professionally and personally in Texas. We were there for 24 years, so that came to be the dominant feature in our professional lives for a long time. Um, in Texas, there's a certain, how shall I put it, uh, lack of immodesty. Uh, <laughs> and, and I actually admire that quite a lot. I, uh, there's a saying in Texas, it ain't bragging if you can do it. Um, and I, I like that. Uh, I wish there was more of it on university campuses. There needs to be a better way to tell our story. It's a great story here at the University of Oregon, and we need to speak loudly about it. Um, Texas and, and Kansas are very different. Kansas is a Midwestern conservative, uh, very, uh, very conservative culture. Oregon has more of a pioneer spirit about it. Uh, this Oregon Trail business is really palpable as an outsider. There's a sense of shared responsibility, shared community, uh, that you have to help one another to get things done, and I admire that quite a lot. There's occasionally a, uh, a focus on equity that spills over to sameness that, that is, is interesting to me. Um, it's one thing to be equitable, and it's another thing to insist that everybody be treated identically. And I don't think that those are necessarily always the same thing. That's a good start. I'm curious, are you, did, have you yourself em embraced the lack of immodesty that you learned in Texas? Is that a part of your own style? Absolutely, I have. <laughs> <laughs> so that's something you're bringing with you to the U of O. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think that, you know, when you've done something wonderful, um, you need to share that information with people. And that happens on this campus all the time. And academics get into this kind of mode of, of behavior that they do something wonderful and then wait to see if anybody notices. <laughs> <laughs> so individually and institutionally we can stand to toot our own horn a little I bit. Think I so. think that's the message, right. right? What was it that attracted you to the president's job here at this particular university? Well, I've spent my entire uh, life at, at AAU mm -hmm. institutions, at research institutions that are have really muscular research agendas, and that was really important to me uh, at every turn in my career. When this job came available, um, it was a really opportune time for Jan and I. Uh, we were both um, um, ready for, for the next step, as it were. And what really fascinated me about the University of Oregon is how good it is on the basis of such little state support, frankly. And I wanted to know more about that, and the more I learned, the more intrigued I became. And then it became clear in my conversations with people around the university that, that this place is ready for, for the implementation of a new model and a new relationship with the state. Um, and I think 
organ. If we, or organs ready for that, and if we do it right, we could do something that would be a model for the entire nation. And that's really what attracted me most. Are you prepared to talk about your conception of that new model of a different relationship with the state? Well, only in the broadest terms. At this point, we're, we're still mm -hmm. working on, on the details, but um, it's not enough to, to just change the governance structure. Um, you have to change the governance structure and take what measures are necessary and possible politically to actually regularize and make predictable the level of support from the state. If you look at any four-year period in the last 30 years, there has been a dramatic spike in tuition during that four-year period. And that dramatic spike in tuition is directly related to a dramatic cut in funding from the state. And while I wish funding was a great deal more than it is right now, it's uh, in this fiscal year it would be about nine and a half percent from the state. And if you take the federal stimulus money out, it will be cl closer to eight and a half percent. Um, however small that is, let's at least make it predictable so that we can tell the students and the families what the cost of th is going to be of their, of their education. We, we really can't do that very well right now. That makes a lot of sense to me as a former department head and in as somebody involved in faculty governance, I know that we often have to delay decisions because we don't know Precisely. what our budget is going to be. So would you say that this is an intermediate term goal, a long term goal, the restructuring of the relationship of the institution to the state? Well, my hope is that we will have some pretty specific, uh, carefully vetted and, and thoroughly uh, examined proposals ready for the next legislative session, not this emergency session in February, which is being, uh, w which, which will be held, but the regular session in 2011. It makes a lot of sense that we undertake something that is both systematic and broad. I've been here for 20 years, and when I arrived, it was upwards of 30 percent of the budget that came from the state, so it's a pretty dramatic mm. change in that time. I think we're really ready to have you lead us onwards. <laughs> Now, you talked about the relationship between the U of O and the state of Oregon. What about the relationship between the university and the city of Eugene? I know you've been working closely with Mayor Kitty Piercy. Mm -hmm. Yes, she's been wonderful. How do you understand the role of the institution in the city? Well, I'm, keep in mind I've been here 10 weeks, so yeah. I, I don't have all the answers. But um, so far what I have seen is that there is a very healthy relationship between the city and the, and the university in, at many levels. Mostly those levels are, are at the level of actually delivering services, so the police and public safety, the, the, the health uh, care professionals on the campus and in the community, uh, the people responsible for emergency planning. They work really, really well together as far as I can see. Um, there's sometimes there's sometimes a, in university communities a sense that that the university isn't paying enough attention to the immediate problems confronting the the host city, as it were. And sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's a misunderstanding of the purpose and the scope of a research university like this. We are in this city. We are part of this city. We're an e incredibly important part of the economy of this city. We are utterly and totally dependent on the city in many areas in terms of service providing and so on. But our focus is really on the whole world. And we have focus, we have people working on state problems and issues, national problems, international problems. And it's not always part of the conversation on the campus to say, so what is this issue related to Afghanistan going to do for the city of Eugene? And that's just part of the nature of a research university. And uh, for those people who are passionately focused on the welfare of the city of e Eugene, they will always wonder why we aren't investing more of our time and talent in solving their problems. Uh, we are investing considerable time and talent in those problems, but not exclusively. I see what you mean, but it looks um, as though the, the city of Eugene and Mayor Piercy herself is really interested in continuing to forge a, a warm and collaborative working relationship. Every, at every turn with every public official and, and fr frankly, 
everyone uh, have welcomed us with open arms and real enthusiasm and 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 passionate commitment to this institution. It's really been very encouraging. That's a great place to start. Yeah. Now, many, many of us uh, were just delighted that our new president in, in your person is a humanist and an active scholar. I was delighted that you're a language person, that you're a Sanskritist. It's, that could not be more from the foundations of the modern university. I'm curious how your background and your active research career still as a humanist influences your understanding of your role as a university president and administrator. Well, you're wonderfully generous to give me a continually acting, uh, active uh, research uh, career. Uh, my research agenda has been reduced to second editions of books and encyclopedia articles. Um, well, my, um, my passion about uh, the University of Oregon is grounded in what public higher education did for me. <coughs> Someone just asked me what the University of Iowa did for me personally. And it was a really great question. Um, he wanted two sentences as an answer, which was also, I thought, really challenging. What a place like this does um, is it, it exposes people, students for the most part, to a much larger world than almost any of us could have imagined before we stepped on these places. And the extent of my ignorance about the larger world was pretty great. It still is great. Um, but what, what, it, what a great university like this does is it not only shows students how big the world really is, but it also explains to them why it is that they've got the capacity to engage that world and really change it. And that's a remarkable discovery huge discovery. Um, in my case, I, was, I became interested in how law and religion interact to affect social norms and so on. Why is it that we don't park in no areas reserved for handicapped people and so on? I mean, it's just a blue sign after all. Um, there are whole layers of explanation or, uh, about that that go to ethics and social values, cultural values, et cetera, that fascinated me. So I studied the two oldest legal traditions still in effect, the Jewish tradition and the Hindu tradition, as an undergraduate um, and went on to study India at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, India has been a wonderful experience for, for me. It's changed my life, my wife's life, my daughter's life. Uh, it's been quite a wonderful experience thing to be involved with that great culture. Most of your publications are in the area, or many of them are in the area of the history of um, the legal system, mm -hmm. and particularly in relation to Hinduism, is that yes, right? Yes, right, yeah, right. Right, right. I think you, I want to go back to the beginning of that previous answer where you talked about the transformative powers of, a, of an education on a, on a university campus or a college campus. I think you, you took that message to the the students graduating in this summer graduation, right? Your, I read uh, part of the text of your speech just from last month. Right. You had a message for them that put the onus on them in a sense. Do you recall what you told them? Well, uh, um, uh, yes, I do. Um, the burden is uh, of education is really on the student. Um, uh, we spend a lot of time, particularly in a university, talking about the importance of the faculty, the, um, and they are vitally important. Uh, we, we spend enormous amounts of energy, time, and money to get the best people we can to teach. But unless the student is receptive and capable of being receptive, it's a futile effort. Um, and I think we've, we've engaged in, particularly in the last, say, 15 years, in a conversation around education that that leaves that out of the, the, the readiness of the student for understanding and, and engaging out of the equation a little bit. And what we're, if we succeed in what we're doing here, those students will go off into the rest of their lives equipped with the capacity to make their own discoveries and answer their own questions. And, and 
it's a terrible misunderstanding of education to think that the only education that takes place is in the classroom when the professor is telling you what the truth is. That doesn't, it doesn't work that way. I often talk about a model of graduate education where people think that we screw the tops off of people's heads, fill them with knowledge, screw the tops back on and push them out the door. The truth of the matter is, is that their questions, their life experiences and understanding of the world mixed with the questions at hand are what really push us to the new discoveries. Um, this is why every faculty member is worried about the quality of the graduate students in their program because they are the impetus for the new discovery. Do you think you have a different take on this because of your own training as a humanist as opposed to say if you'd come through the sciences or the social sciences? Well, of course, it's impossible to know uh, since I didn't go through the sciences or social sciences, but I don't think so. I think in conversations with colleagues, um, they really, uh, regardless of the field, they are the ones, uh, it's, it's the s graduate students who are the ones who are really pressing and pushing and making the new discoveries possible. Even, even the most ignorant and ill-informed question can sometimes just open your eyes to an explanation that you hadn't ever thought of before. And it's, it's quite wonderful. And I've also had that, as I'm sure you have, that experience I very many times with undergraduate students as well. Yes, it happens every day in the classroom. Yeah. That's really true. I wanted to get back to um, the question of research universities. You said that you've spent your career in institutions that belong to the AAU, the American Association of Universities. The University of Oregon is a member institution. Faculty salaries here at U of O are at the very bottom of the AAU rank. I think you've, uh, you've said you wanted to do something about this issue. Any idea how you can address it? Well, uh, you're right. Uh, the salaries at the University of Oregon are, are probably the greatest threat to the future of the University of Oregon. A university, no matter how complex and how far-reaching its, its, its impact, is only as good as its faculty. Because when the faculty begin to deteriorate in terms of their research and their teaching, the students, the best students don't come any longer because there are other options out there. And once that begins to happen, you have a, a slide to mediocrity that's pretty much intolerable. Um, so we really have to address the, the question of faculty salaries. In an environment like we're in right now where people in Oregon are suffering really badly, uh, I'm doing a lot of traveling around the state, and there are areas of the state where there's 30 and 35 percent unemployment. In that environment, it sounds pretty um, insensitive at best to be talking about how poorly paid faculty are. But the fact of the matter is, is that these faculty are, are a rare commodity in higher education. And we are not functioning in a state or a regional environment. We're functioning in an international environment. And even the universities that are in the worst possible financial shape will do hiring this year. Berkeley, I've been told, does, uh, uh, hires about 100 people a year. They're likely to hire only 10 this year. Pretty desperate straits. But those 10 will be the best that they can find. And they will not offer them average salaries. They will offer them very compelling salaries. And those 10 will be plucked from places that can't pay comparable salaries. And it's not really just about salary. Salary is often the easiest thing to hold on to really good faculty. It's what kind of support for students are there, is there going to be? What kind of facilities do you have for me to do my work? How's the library in my field? What kind of investment are you going to make in adjacent areas of investigation that will support me? And all of that taken together is what you have to have to maintain that great faculty. We have a great faculty. In fact, it's astonishing to me how good this faculty is. We are right now at about 80% of the average salary of our peer comparators, so we're 20% below average. One of the first questions that occurred to me, the v maybe the first question that occurred to me after I began looking into this place, is how do they hang on to the quality of faculty they do under those circumstances? Well, I live here now, and so I have some inkling about uh, 
the quality of life is a compensating factor, but it's probably not much more of a compensating factor, and I'm really concerned about that. Uh, we, we have some plans, uh, frankly, to, to address that question, the question of faculty compensation. It will require, in the, particularly in this environment, some really significant reallocation of funds that will be painful in some ways. This isn't the moment right now to do it uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but it can't be put off for very much longer. One of the many financial <laughs> issues you'll be juggling in the next little while. I wanted to get back to what you said about your um, tour of discovery of the state of Oregon. I know you've spent a lot of time on the road, no doubt with Jan, your yes, wife as well. Right. What kind of communities and what kind of groups have you been meeting and interacting with across the state? Well, we set a goal of meeting every uh, legislator in their home district if possible. That won't be uh, possible. As I've met some of them in Salem and some of them here in Eugene, et cetera. But um, we really wanted to meet every legislator in their home district. I want to meet the heads of every one of the federally recognized tribes. Um, I want to meet all the heads of the uh, community colleges throughout the state. I've already met with all of the university uh, state university presidents, um, and I wanted to meet with alumni and political leaders in, in the regions uh, throughout Oregon. Oregon's a very big state, um, and I say that having spent 24 years in Texas. Uh, Oregon's a big state, um, and it's got significant variations, not just in geography and geology, but, um, but in terms of the economic and political environments that you find. Portland is very different than than La Grande, and, uh, and Ontario is very different than Roseburg. And I need to know what the issues are in those regions, and I also need to know how the university is perceived and plays a role in those communities. This is, after all, the University of Oregon, not the University of Eugene or the Willamette Valley or Western Oregon, but the University of Oregon. And I've learned a ton in the last 10 weeks. We've traveled 6,000 miles in that period of time around Oregon. I know because I've had so many miles I've put on my car. Uh, and, uh, and we've been to places as diverse as Charleston on the coast, to Roseburg, Medford, Ashland, Jacksonville, the Brit Festival, the Shakespeare Festival, um, Bend, La Grande. Uh, I've been in two parades. I was in the Eugene Celebration Parade, which was great, great fun. And we just got back from the Pendleton Roundup, where Jan and I broke with tradition and rode horses in the parade instead of the wagon. It was great fun. <laughs> it sounds really terrific, actually. I'm sure you're really enjoying it, as well as yes, we meeting the constituency of the, of the university. We don't have that much time left, Richard, but I wanted to, I think I would be remiss if I didn't address with you, briefly at least, your understanding of the relationship between high visibility, big budget sports mm -hmm. and the academic side of the institution. Could you address that in a, in a few sentences? You I've can never, have more I've than two. I've never been asked that question before. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, actually, it, uh, we have to start by understanding that there are on this campus 500 young people who are getting an education paid for that many of whom would not have otherwise. So just for that, sports is, is worthy of our, of our recognition. But it's also really important to remember that there's a difference between the education that takes place on this campus and the entertainment that takes place on the campus in the form of sports. There are 50 or 60,000 people who come to Autzen Stadium and pay a, quite a lot of money to sit there and watch the football game. I've not yet had that many people want to come to one of my Sanskrit lectures, let alone pay for it. But that's really entertainment, and, and it's important for us to remember that that's entertainment, and it is not the educational mission that we have as our central point. Um, that helps put in perspective, I think, the, the, the difference. And also the fact that the, at the University of Oregon, athletics is self-sustaining. So we do not take money away from the educational core mission and invest it in that entertainment. 
I think you also have been on the record as saying that in many ways um, the sporting program can be a kind of a liaison between the university and the community. That's exactly right. It buys mind share in, uh, in audiences that really don't care much about Sanskrit probably, but they care deeply about this institution because of the identity that they have with the sports enterprise, whether it's the football team or the lacrosse team. And what comes of that is, is sympathy, support, enthusiasm, a willingness to, to hear what we have to say. And for those of us who know Europe, for example, the European universities would love to have the enthusiasm that professional sports engenders in the wide population focused on those universities, but they don't have it, and we do, and we're very lucky. That's a very balanced perspective, and it sounds as though you'll be a great diplomat on this issue. <laughs> I have a one final question, which is a totally frivolous one. You have become known in the community very quickly for your dapper headwear. <laughs> You're always seen with some kind of an appropriate hat. Where, how did you develop that habit? Um, I'd love to say it's just raw aesthetic sense, but the truth of the matter is, is that I've had now three dermatologists tell me, uh, because of hypersensitivity to the sun, not to go outside without a hat with at least a two-inch brim. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like the perfect place to end. We will watch for the whole wardrobe of them as the year goes through the seasons. <laughs> Richard, thank you for coming to talk to us. It's thank been you a for pleasure to, to hear you for a few minutes, and I hope we can do this on a regular basis. I'd love to. And be great to check in with you this time next year. Great. Thank you. We've been speaking with Richard LaRiviere, President of the University of Oregon. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time.